Sabe? Maps. Over the years, I developed a few litmus tests to identify fellow natural geographers, not that that's really so important. But the principal one involves maps. If a map, a map of any kind, truly fascinates you, then you're a natural. I read maps before I could read words, poring over them and asking a hundred questions. My poor sister eventually grew so exasperated that she gave me her own little apples just to keep me from sneaking into her room and taking it from her bookshelf. I still own that battered old red book. Geotheism is a religion with a book, the best book. Natural geographers really don't need to be taught how to use maps and atlases. We just naturally understand what they are and why they exist. I would say that by maybe the age of five or six at the latest, I was already drawing maps. I need that back real quick. Now. <laughs> to judge from specimens collected from my baby book, this is a map. It's more than that. It's a map of my front yard. And it's also a picture of a cultural landscape. And it's not like all those other dorky houses that kids draw. It looks exactly like our house in our yard. The sidewalk curves where it's supposed to curve. It's a map of our front yard. And sometimes I had others. Sometimes I would try to copy the shape of the state of Texas. Or I would draw maps on different ways to get to my friend's house who lived just down the block. And that was before I was reading. It even says on one of those pages, what does it say there? Four years old. Wow. He drew the bloody map when he was four years old. That's a natural. I still own most of the oil company maps we used on that trip to Colorado. Locked in my office downstairs right now. Each of those precious relic maps is marked with green lines made out of what we used to call airplane, model airplane dope, which is the stuff I got highest on in my life, I want to tell you. <laughs> It was green. I was making a green airplane, and the lines on the map are all green airplane dope. But they show exactly where we went through five different states, and I drew those lines myself when I was only seven. On to Colorado. In fact, I stood on my feet in that 1937 Dodge, nearly all the way to and from Colorado. Even through that corner of Kansas we went, which is something like Iowa. My favorite place was on the French bench seat. It wouldn't allow you to do that today. Directly between my uncle and my father, only slightly less favored was the place directly behind that seat on the rear floorboard. My elbows resting atop the woolen upholstered seat back. And my feet slightly boosted by the lump or mound on the floor through which some sort of cables or machinery pass, which I've never understood, not being mechanical. Right. And all the while, my eyes swept the horizon. I wanted to be the one who discovered things. Darkish Capulin Mountain, though I didn't know its name, an extinct but almost fully intact volcano in eastern New Mexico. That was the first high ground I had ever seen in my life. And it caught my eye before anyone else's. 
but my crowning achievement involved noticing something odd about an elongated, stationary, distant white cloud beyond Capulet. Are those clouds, I said, or are those the snowy mountains you told me about? Well, after that side of the Sangre de Cristos, which I didn't also know what to call, I was hooked for sure. Weep John Wesley for my lost geotheistic soul. Now I belong to John Wesley Powell instead. The geographer and everyone. Now we can make way too much of this natural thing. To one degree or another, geography lies in every one of us. It's a part of being human. Beyond the places we've seen and explored, always lies the unknown, including some truly mysterious and exotic lands. We often tend to populate these regions with our fantasies and fears. Dragons festoon old maps of corners of Gaia's domain. But familiar places play a crucial role too. All places possess an emotional significance. It contributes profoundly to our, our identity as individual human beings. We all must belong somewhere to be complete persons. At least in my kind of geography, we do. Geography, as I would discover, is an outgrowth of both our curiosity about places other than our own and a need to come to grips with the place-centered element within our very spirit and soul. Paradox alert. Now there's a paradox at work here. Geography is at once everywhere, nearby places with familiar sounding names, and those faraway places with strange sounding ones. It's a subject matter literally surrounding and enveloping us while permeating our inner being. And yet, when you try to find geography as an academic discipline, it's like giant Gulliver in search of Lilliput. The undergraduate or graduate major in geography resembles a very small town or a hamlet. It's not even marked on many maps. Finding it is uh, as difficult as stumbling into Shangri-La, Ultima Thule, or the seven cities of Sepulveda. I got lucky. I really got lucky. I found geography easily. It wasn't just that I got to go to Colorado. They actually taught some geography in the public schools when I went to Dallas. I remember map drawing assignments, including one involving Iberia in, say, like the fourth grade. And we used to make those wonderful terrain maps on pieces of thick cardboard out of some concoction of salt and flour and food color. Now, geography had already been folded into the social studies by that time in those neat old world geography textbooks of the 1920s and earlier were gone. We did have back issues of the National Geographic magazine in the school library. In any case, my family had subscribed for decades. Most of my buddies poured through those looking for sex education and finding it. But I can honestly say that as a late bloomer, I went for the geography. Then I got lucky again. I found the geography in my very first semester at Southern Methodist University. My kindly guide through the secret passes to this blessed shrine of geotheism was Professor Edwin J. Foskey. 
charismatic and dynamic teacher.